Welcome to today's AIM Center webinar, Teaching the Twice Generation. I'm Cynthia Curry, Director of Technical Assistance for the National Center on AIM. In addition to our presenter, Beth Cross, I'd like to thank Leslie O'Callaghan, our Operations Coordinator, Lynn McCormick, our Senior Technologist, and our live captioning uh, provider, Nicole, for providing assistance today. A few logistical notes that I think will be helpful is uh, to prevent background noise, all participants' microphones and phone lines are muted. Please enter your questions and your comments in the chat pod, which is being monitored by our AIM Center staff. Technical issues will be addressed immediately, while questions for our presenters will be addressed uh, before the web webinar ends. The slides for today's webinar and the digital handout, as I stated just a few minutes ago, are available on this event's page at the AIM Center website and Leslie has posted that link in the chat. This webinar is being recorded and live captioned. Both the archive and the transcript will be available on the AIM Center's webpage for this event within the coming week. At the conclusion of today's webinar, an evaluation link will be made available. We value your feedback and we use it to continuously improve our webinars and other technical assistance activities. Thanks in advance for taking a couple of minutes to complete that for us. For those of you who are new to the AIM Center, we are a capacity building technical assistance project and we work with many stakeholders that support learners across the lifespan. Our goal is to increase the availability and the use of high quality accessible materials and technologies that improve outcomes for learners with disabilities. And to that end, early learning, uh, we have a page on our website that's dedicated to early learning. We encourage you to visit this page uh, to connect with helpful resources on early learning and accessible educational materials. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Beth Poss. Uh, she's currently a special education administrator for the preschool education program in the Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. As a former member of the curriculum writing team, she helped design and implement a curriculum aligned with the Common Core State Standards and the principles of universal design for learning. She's an adjunct faculty member for Johns Hopkins University and presents nationally on best practices in professional development, early childhood special education, disability, assistive technology, instructional technology, and universal design for learning. Today, we're fortunate to have her inform us about the best practices for using technology to support the development of young children. Thanks for being here, Beth. The presentation is all yours. Thank you, and <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? If there's any issues, let me know. Um, and yeah, we're here today to talk about what I like to call the swipe generation. Um, so my contact information, if you um, want to get a hold of me or if you care to follow me on Twitter, um, I'm at PossBeth on Twitter and PossBeth at gmail.com. So, I saw this uh, meme, I guess, on Facebook um, a while ago, and it said, today, two-year-olds can unlock a phone, open and close their favorite apps all by themselves. When I was that age, I was eating dirt. So it's a different world that we live in, and that's why I like to refer to them as the swipe generation. I hope some of you guys can relate to that. Um, so our outcomes today is we want to make sure that we um, are looking at some examples of current research on the use of technology for children birth to eight years old. Um, we're going to differentiate about the implications of assistive technology for young children versus the use of technology as an early learning tool. We're going to look at developmentally appropriate apps and other technology resources that support the growth of language play literacy and early math skills, and we're going to consider how to include developmentally <coughs> appropriate technology in IFSPs and IEPs. A lot to get done in an hour. So are you guys excited? I hope so, as we talk about toddlers and technology. So there's um, a survey. You should, should be able to see the poll off to your uh, right on the screen. Oops, right there. Um, and I'd like to get to know what your thoughts are currently about infants and toddlers and um, the amount of screen time that sh they should have. So you can just click in the, um, the radio button on whether they should have no screen time, some screen time, or that, that it doesn't matter. 
we'll give a minute. Looks like we've got most people putting in their responses. So most people are saying some screen time. A few people are saying no screen time. And so we're going to come back to this question, but I just wanted to get a sense of what people's um, thoughts are at this moment um, before we go. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so let's play a little bit. I am going to be sharing my screen with you guys today um, a few times. So if there's any lag time between what I'm talking about and what's on the screen, you'll just let me know. That's myself and my daughter. Okay, so we're going to take a look um, at an app. Um, it's a Tokaboka app called Toka Monsters, uh, Toka Kitchen Monsters specifically, and we're just going to look at it for a second. I'll go into one of these monsters. Oh, and we'll give him some food to have on his. Okay, and uh, maybe see, maybe we should, uh, hmm, oops, my broccoli seems to have missed the plate completely. Let me try that again. Maybe a little pepper on that broccoli, maybe a little salt on that broccoli. Let's see if I've got some utensils, something I can do with it. Ooh, uh, let's, uh, let's do a little slice and dice of that broccoli. Uh, okay, let's see, maybe go back. Oh, he doesn't seem to like that broccoli very much. Let's do one more thing to him. Maybe he would like it better if we pureed it a little bit. Let's see what happens. Okay, well, maybe let's see if he likes that better now. Oh, he's still saying he doesn't like it. Well, what happens if I try to feed it to him anyways? Oh, he's, he's really not happy with it help guide our use because you guys made some really good comments um, in the um, in the chat window about working on fine motor skills and not having knives um, although I do like the blender part a lot um, <laughs> I think sometimes some of our kids have that same reaction um, to their <clears throat> pureed food um, okay so I seem to be in that's good um, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at some policy statements. I'm going to go ahead and advance. So there, the um, American Association of Pediatrics um, came out with, which has sort of been the gold standard of what most people have looked at in terms of, um, certainly from a parenting perspective um, and often from an educational perspective as well, about um, use of screen time. Um, and the previous guidelines that everybody had uh, discussed in the past was like no screen time at all until until at least um, age two. Um, and in October of this year, AAP came out with some new guidelines um, and it really reflect the changing landscape because what they were referring to in the past as screen time was previously, um, it was created previous to like iPads even coming along and it really was about that um, static use of screens, television, videos, and things like that. Um, and so screen time has really evolved and changed, and so they came up with this. And really what they're talking about is that while screens have changed, parenting has not changed. And um, that role modeling, so somebody was talking about that smart participant, and I think that's really what they were talking about is who is the person that's using this alongside um, that young child? That role modeling is critical. It's also how we model our own use of screens with kids um, and that tendency to um, uh, have them out a lot and that's what kids see and that's what they want. Um, the idea that we learn from each other. The idea that content really, really matters and with that curation, which is what we're doing today, is we're looking evaluatively at apps um, and what's out there um, and making good decisions based on that. That co-engagement, so it's not about putting your kid in front of a screen and walking away, it's about 
using a screen with kids. Um, that playtime is important, both playtime digitally and playtime in three-dimensional real life, that we need to set limits. We need to absolutely create tech-free zones and that kids will be kids. And so these are the new guidelines from AAAP. Um, the National Association of Education of Young Children also has a policy statement. And this has been around since um, about 2014. Um, and it really talks about how um, the use of multi, they call what they call multi-touch screens, so tablets, essentially, um, and movement-activated technologies that can respond to children's touch and movement, that with guidance, these technology tools can be harnessed for learning and for development, but that without guidance, the usage can be inappropriate and can interfere with learning and development. And what they're really talking about is that we really need to look at interactive versus non-interactive or solitary use of technology, um, that we need to look at um, technology um, as a means to an end instead of simply technology for technology's sake. Uh, and that we need to look at technology as a way of strengthening and building adult-child relationships. And that we can do that, that there are effective uses. So in particular, what NAEYC talks about with age two is that there may be appropriate use from birth to age two, may be appropriate uses of technology for infants and toddlers in some context. And really what they're talking about mostly is the idea of viewing digital photos, participating in interactions with Skype or, or um, <clears throat> other tools, FaceTime, other tools, um, and the idea that co-viewing ebooks, um, that a book is a book regardless, and we're going to look at some things like that, a book is a book regardless of whether it's a digital book or whether it's a book that's print and paper. Um, and so that it's not a matter of no technology for that age, but um, how we use it, that technology um, to, to build relationships. So language and literacy are irre irretrievably um, intertwined. So there was a great sign in a library recently, there is no app to replace your lap. Read to your child. But the idea that reading to our child our children in this day and age can actually mean reading with um, an iPad or another type of mobile technology, that books are coming in many, many different forms. Um, and so um, we can use books that are digitally, um, and that actually digital um, books can open up um, access to books for a much wider um, variety of individuals um, who may have access through their public library system or through other per fee systems, um, more and more books. Um, the piece that play is central, and we're going to look at some of these examples in particular, thanks Cynthia, um, that play is central to development and learning. And it's the idea that technology and, um, and media, you know, have to mirror their interactions with play, other play materials, that we have to have opportunities um, that it looks like the same type of sensory motor or practice play, make-believe play, and games with rules. Um, uh, and, and we're going to take a look at some apps and some resources that can allow students to do this, that allow students to engage with media in playful and creative ways. Um, RAND Corporation talks about moving beyond screen time and that there are six considerations um, in re defining the technology use. It's that is it purposefully integrated to support learning? Um, and again, this is a lot of these things you're going to hear the same things by multiple groups. Is it solitary or is it taking place with others? Is it sedentary or mobile? And if you don't think that digital screen time can be mobile, then think about all of the people that got out there this summer and, and still out there with the whole Pokemon Go. Um, so there are opportunities for mobile <coughs> interactions with technology. Um, what's the content and the features of the media? Are the devices features age appropriate? And what's the total screen time involved? So talk about the National Education Technology Plan. Um, and that's really not necessarily focused on very young children, but I think it's something that is across the um, age span. And they are really saying that they are not looking for passive use 
of technology where you're sitting and um, and doing the equivalent of a digital worksheet. And that's for any age, and I would really stress. And that instead it's about global interactions, um, it's um, opportunities for peer um, interaction, um, and um, even opportunities uh, for, for coding, even with very young, very young kids. Um, there's some really interesting research that was done by um, Zero to Three. Um, uh, the, the organization Zero to Three. And they talk about what is called the 2D to 3D transfer deficit. Um, and what they found is that it is much easier for young children to comprehend information from real life experiences with people and objects as compared to information delivered via a screen. That's not really surprising, right? That real life hands-on experiences are more meaningful um, than screen experiences. And what they found is that children who were less than two years old didn't have the symbolic thinking skills to understand that what they see on the screen is a stand-in or a symbol for the real thing. And so what that really points us to is that when we engage in screen time with young children or developmentally young children, that we really need to pair those 2D screen time experiences with 3D real life experiences to reduce that transfer deficit. Um, and so, you know, that's the idea that um, if you're going to play games um, that are on the tablet or on the computer, then you need to use um, the same types of things before and after so that they can see. So if you're, we're going to look at some apps where you could be playing with a ball or a, or a block or in a play kitchen. Um, maybe not quite the same play kitchen that we just saw with the monsters, but you know, we might be using a blender, maybe not the knife the same way. Um, and point out and being able to label those objects in real life. Um, Going back, actually, I'm going to go back to the last screen just for a second. So the idea that, um, let me go back. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to go back. There we go. Um, there is some research that is on video conferencing for babies with very young children. Um, and it showed that infants are able to distinguish between an adult interacting with them in real life in a video chat and a video that's not directed to them, like a television, you know, Sesame Street, whatever it is that they might have on, um, that they reacted differently. Um, they had changes in affect when the video chat was out of sync. So if what they were seeing didn't match what they were hearing, um, and that they were, when they looked at um, a mother via video chat versus a mother on the phone with a child, that they were more comforted by the mother via video chat than simply by telephone. Um, and that these interactions that were facilitated by an adult on the other end, so the adult who is with the child as well as the adult that is video chatting with the child, that that really helps support um, their interactions and their perceptions of reality. So let's, um, you know, not, I don't want anybody walking away from this thinking that um, this is all about, well, yay, technology is good and we don't have to do non-tech activity. It's really about balance um, between activities um, that are tech-based and activities that are non-tech. So we're going to look at an app called Woodblocks for Kids in a few minutes. Um, but we need to balance that with giving kids opportunities with real three-dimensional blocks. Um, let's talk a little bit about universal design for learning, since we are in this with CAS, um, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so universal design for learning is the framework for curriculum design for instruction and assessment that gives all students equal opportunity to learn and demonstrate what they've learned. And just to make sure everybody's on the same page, this is not a special ed initiative. This is for all kids. 
Um, and when we talk about universal design for learning in early childhood, I really like to boil it down to that there are choices for young children. Um, that we need to give kids lots of different ways to interact um, and make meaningful choices within their environment. And so you see in front of you, there's a whole lot of different ways that kids could be learning about a favorite early childhood theme like farm animals. So it might be playing with three-dimensional farm animals. It might be playing a game on the computer or an app. Um, it might be um, using augmentative communication tools to talk about the farm. That There's lots of different ways that we can have kids um, getting opportunities to make choices as opposed to directing them, it's time now to do this activity or this activity. So when you think about universal design for learning with young kids, I really want people to think about how am I giving kids choice. So with this in mind, let's think about a typical um, early childhood classroom activity. You're studying the farm. Um, and you might, um, as one of your activities, have an art activity set up. Um, that is having kids take a sponge and put brown paint on a pink pig, right? Don't we all need to know that pigs are, are muddy and that we're going to put paint on them? Um, but what I want people to think about it is what is the goal of that activity? Is it to put paint on the pig? Or is it to learn about pigs? and that they might have new colors, and that they might have mud on them, and that they say oink, um, and that they've got facial features, that they've got legs. It might be that you want to have fine motor experiences, right, um, and be able to interact. But that there's not one way that you can do that. So when we give kids a set art activity to simply use that sponge to paint brown mud, brown paint, on a pink pig, that we might be more cognizant about giving kids a choice. Because you might have the kid with some sensory needs that says, oh, I do not want to touch that brown paint. Um, and can they get the same experience from um, another activity, from doing it digitally on um, an iPad, from gluing the features on a pig, from coloring, um, from using bingo markers. So again, there's lots of different ways that I can get <clears throat> to the same set of skills for a young child. It's not about just one way. But typically, when we see that center activity set up for kids in an early childhood classroom, there's only one way to do it. That's not universal design for learning. That's not choice. So something to think about as we go through this all. Um, that, thanks for moving that over. That, when we talk about the three principles of universal design for learning, multiple and flexible means of representation or presentation of information, multiple and flexible means of action and expression by the students, and multiple and flexible means of engaging and maintaining the engagement of the learner, that that applies as much in the early childhood setting as it does with school age. Um, and that the core of UDL is that we need to plan for choice, because there's not a single best way to learn, and there's not a single best way to demonstrate attainment of proficiency, and there's not a single best way to motivate and engage. Um, there's an excellent resource that um, Sue Mistret has um, created. Um, it's a checklist to support early, UD, excuse me, to support UDL reflection in the early childhood classroom. And um, in the handout, there should be links to all of these. Um, and what she really, uh, so this is a great checklist. You'll have it as, um, available to you as a Google Doc. Um, and it really asks you to reflect on your practices in your classroom about providing choice in materials with students, um, about enhancing and extending opportunities for communication and interaction. Um, and for providing play-based resources that can be access, accessed by the widest range of children um, possible, including those with physical and sensory um, or developmental disabilities. Um, and for providing best practice with young children by providing a multi-sensory engaging learning experience. So I recommend that everybody take a look at this and 
it's a great way to engage in um, a reflection on how universally designed for learning is your early childhood classroom. Um, let's talk just a little bit about, whoa, let's go back. I just lost my screen for a second. For a second. Okay, I'm back in. Okay, I'm back in. But I'm hearing myself. But I'm hearing myself. But I'm hearing myself. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, I'm having a show. I'm going to mute my speakers, but I won't know if I'm hearing you then or not. So if somebody needs to talk to me. Yes. Sure. Okay, now I can, I can hear you fine. Okay, yes, so you, misconceptions. You Are you guys still hearing the echo? No, you, you, uh, you sound fine. You just need to be okay. re-elevated to a presenter. For some reason, okay. uh, you were you picked me out up again. for a second. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, but I'll keep talking we'll about assistive you. technology. So there are mis some misperceptions and misconceptions that create some limited recommendations for assistive technology for young children. Um, and one of those is that the perspective that children with disabilities have to have an understanding of cause and effect or other cognitive skills in order to use AT devices. Um, and there's some good resources there that are, again, linked in your handout. Um, Sullivan and Lewis and um, Cress and Marvin that really um, show that that's not necessary, that there are not prerequisites for this. Um, and that um, the idea that providers believe that using assistive technology means giving up on a child, being able to learn to perform a particular skill. And we also know that that's not true. And there's a really great resource, again, from Mistret um, that uh, disputes that well. So some good resources there. Um, for you all to be able to um, look at. I seem to be all back in just fine. Um, and when we talk about incorporating technology into the IFSP or the IEP for a young children, for a young child, um, it's really important to look at how the family views technology as a part of their routine. So those of you that are working with IFSPs know that we look at family routines. Um, <clears throat> as a part of the considerations for developing that individualized family service plan, um, what those parents' priorities, needs, and concerns are, and how that technology is going to be used. Is it going to be built as the outcome or the goal? Um, is it a service or is it a strategy? And again, um, going back to that research when we talk to families about how they're using technology, because we can get both ends of the spectrum, parents who are vehemently against using technology with your young children because their pediatrician may have told them no screen time, limited screen time, um, or the opposite where um, it's become the only means that they might have to, um, uh, uh, to calm their child or to have a break. Um, and so finding a balance and finding where things fit in. And then using that research that I discussed earlier um, with you about um, how to help guide parents. Um, so let's talk about apps. There's an avalanche out there. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of apps. And if you would have searched educational apps um, for early childhood on the App Store, on the Apple Store, or in Google, you would find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, there's some excellent resources um, for you to refer back to. Common Sense Media um, has great reviews. And we're going to look very specifically at some criteria that I've developed for making choices about an early, um, effective early childhood app. Um, the first is that is it open-ended to support play and problem solving? So let's think about that in terms of the, um, the Tokoboka app, the Monster Kitchen one. That was open-ended, right? Okay, We had to do some problem solving there. What we're, how are we going to explore things? Um, does it promote literacy, language, and vocabulary development without drill and kill? 
It's not as it says in the National Technology Plan about creating digitized worksheets. It's about making things active and involved. Um, does it include rich, engaging activities that invite a high degree um, of control by the user? Does it encourage mo movement, both fine and gross motor? We want to look for that as well. Um, does it enhance and encourage interaction with adults or peers rather than promoting solitary exploration? And is it culturally diverse and free of stereotypes? And does it meet a developmental need? So keep those things in mind as we look at some apps over the next 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the Tokoboka app. Um, and I'm going to take you in and show you um, some apps that um, are going to uh, support some um, problem solving that are open and can support some problem solving. So I am going to hopefully not have any issues with um, the same, but I'm just going to talk about a few different ones in particular. So again, the My Play Home series is a great one for um, playing a pairing that 2D, 3D um, uh, transfer deficit. Because you can play with the My Play Home kitchen, uh, My Play Home, and go into the kitchen, go into the living room, go into the bedroom, um, and actually, it's kind of like um, uh, color forms. If people remember color forms on steroids, so moving the people around in the home, being able to put them on different furniture, being able to activate different appliances in the home, and then pairing that with an opportunity to play in a playhouse, a play kitchen, a real kitchen for that matter. Um, Woodblocks for Kids is an excellent app, and that's the title of it is Woodblocks for Kids. Um, and um, it allows for real um, life actions with blocks. The blocks are not three-dimensional, but they act three-dimensional in space. So when you cook them and move them about on the screen, you can stack them up and knock them over just like you could with actual blocks. It's a great tool for kids that may have motor needs that impact their ability to actually play with blocks. Block play is critically important um, in the development of early math and science skills. Um, and um, with block for kids is a great way um, to get kids engaged in it, either at the digital end and then move into playing with blocks, or to take playing with blocks and then look at what happens. Does the same thing happen on the screen? Um, the Tiggly apps are ones that I really wanted to be able to show you. So Tiggly has a series of apps. Um, and when you, uh, it come, the apps themselves don't come with you. You have to go physically purchase manipulatives that go with it. So um, you've got manipulatives with letters shapes and counting bars. Um, so I know that there was somebody um, that was on the webinar that had said that they work with a deaf blind population or people that wanted to be able to promote um, physical manipulation. So this is a way that we get hands-on manipulatives on the screen with kids. Um, and those manipulatives actually activate um, the app. So the Tiggly apps are fantastic for that. Um, the sets run about $30 a package. The apps themselves can be freely downloaded, but when you pair them with the manipulatives, they really present um, a really rich experience. Um, some apps that build uh, language, um, looking at vocabulary and turn taking, being able to expand communicative intent, initiate language, um, encourage expressive output. You could really see how supporting comprehension, how any open-ended app would really be able um, to um, support that. So if we think about, unfortunately, the one app that we've been able to see, the, um, the Tokoboka app, you could see how you could really, with a communication partner, um, be able to um, get into uh, some really rich language. So being able to make choices, did they want the tomato or the broccoli or the hot dog that was in the refrigerator? Um, was the monster going to eat that? No, he thinks that yuck, that's yucky. He made a face for it. Um, so being able to use that in an interactive manner. Could we sit a kid down with that app and have them play with it all by themselves? Sure. You can do that with almost any of these. But the idea behind it is how are we using that app to strengthen that, um, that adult-child interaction or that child-to-child -child interaction 
where they're both getting an opportunity to negotiate using the app. Um, more apps that promote literacy and language. So there's a fantastic app and actually website out there that's called Epic. Um, if you go to getepic.com, it is free for educators. Um, there's a small monthly charge of a few dollars um, for parents for home use. But educators can set up classrooms for their children, and there are hundreds of books from pre-K up through um, late elementary, early middle school level. Um, and what I really like about Epic is it is not about bells and whistles. You may have seen a lot of um, books, e-books out there um, for young kids, the Dr. Seuss ones or some of the Sesame Street ones, where there's a lot of bells and whistles going on. And I actually feel that that can be a distraction um, in um, using um, books with kids. And if we want to go back to that, there is no app that um, replaces your lap. Um, when we use digital books um, on Epic um, or in your <clears throat> um, public e-library, and most states and counties within that have um, a public e-library where you can check out books on an iPad or a tablet or a smartphone um, and be able to literally just sit with a child and have a never-ending assortment of books. Um, within Epic, there are a variety of um, books that are um, have no narration to them and books that have narration, so both audio and non-audio books. Um, but because they're digital and you can resize the screen at any time to be able to zoom in or out on a particular feature um, or a illustration in the book or text that you want to point out, um, it really enriches that um, learning experience. But it's not something that you would only do um, that, that a child that's a non-reader would do just completely independently. It's the same as if they were using real books. They might play with them independently, but they're going to crawl up into your lap um, and ask to, to be read. And because they're digital and in classrooms, early childhood classrooms that have access to smart boards, to be able to project those so that you can really support kids um, with various sensory disabilities um, that need that. <clears throat> um, the Tiggly apps also have some great um, uh, uh, reading components with them as well. And there's a whole host of, of different apps that work on um, early literacy skills um, in, in ways. And again, to make those parallels between um, the 3D and the 2D, um, you can take an app like Magnetic Alphabet and um, it's just like you were using magnetic letters on a, um, on a, uh, a refrigerator or on any metal surface, um, but uh, it's on the um, iPad. And there's a whole host of numbers, backgrounds, um, and different shapes, kind of like those cutouts that you can make in, in school classrooms. So again, expanding on that 2D and 3D, are just a different way to do it, providing those choices. Um, <clears throat> That's a screenshot of Epic. You can see some of the different resources that are in there. Um, and then there's a great app called Metamorphabet um, that I really love. Um, it takes you through the alphabet. Um, and I like it because it's got all sorts of different um, uh, vocabulary that kids can explore. It's not just your typical uh, vocabulary that you might see. Um, just looking to see if I can somehow or other get back to that screen to share my screen with you guys. Uh, it's not going to happen today. Um, so again, another one, Metamorphabet is another really wonderful open-ended um, ABC app that you can show. Um, MoMA's Art Lab um, is a fantastic app to promote creativity and the, um, and the arts, as well as um, drawing apps. There's a, my favorite of all the drawing apps that are out there is called Drawing Pad. It does, uh, it's about a $2.99 app, so it's not completely free, but it has such a nice range of, of drawing tools that are very realistic, from um, color pencils to magic markers to paint. Um, the Art of Glow is one that's great if you are um, working with students who need a little more high contrast and um, brightness against a dark background, so those kids with some visual impairments. 
Um, and, uh, um, and not to forget musical apps out there. There's a wonderful one um, from Toka Boca called Toka Band. Um, and that's one of the Toka ones that's completely free and gives kids an opportunity to explore with all sorts of different um, with all sorts of different musical instruments and sound makers um, that are out there. Um, so people don't always think about using apps for movement for fine and gross motor. Um, again, those different um, those different drawing apps are all going to work on fine motor, but some things that work on gross motor can be a little harder to find. Um, and so two of my favorites um, as far as apps go is one that is called um, Yogaverse I Am Love, and it teaches young children, there's a screenshot there of it, um, it teaches young children along with their parents yoga moves. There's um, two books that are related to it that take them through a story. Um, where they can incorporate the yoga moves, and then it uses a, a series of short snippets to teach kids those moves and how to go through them. So really nice um, if you want, if, if that's the way to engage a child sometimes initially um, in, in that motor experience. Um, another one is the Elmo Video Maker. And so one of the tools with the Elmo Video Maker is where it um, has Elmo dancing, and then it asks the child to dance uses the camera to capture it, and then plays it back to them in the context of the scene that Elmo is in. So again, where the child is able to um, video themselves dancing, and it gets put back into the screen with Elmo, a great way to encourage motor language um, and, and interaction. And then one of my all-time favorite things to do is just get out there with kids, take videos, take pictures, bring them back, um, and be able to reflect on them and share them. Um, this is the most photographed and videographed generation ever in the world. Um, and we can use that to our advantage. Um, there's some wonderful apps to um, promote social emotional development. And I, I think when this is all over, I'm going to go use the Settle Your Glitter app myself. Um, it, uh, it allows kids to um, select how they're feeling, worried, sad, frustrated, to the degree to what they're feeling, a little bit, a lot. And then it uses that little puffer fish. You shake your iPad, um, and it gets glitter like in a snow globe. And you use the little puffer fish prompts you for your breath in and out to be able to settle that glitter down. Um, so uh, nice one that I think I'm going to use in a few minutes. Um, I want to get um, some sharing in, in the chat pod on what your um, final thoughts are. I, again, my apologies that we didn't get to see a lot of the apps that I wanted to. Um, but what are your closing thoughts? Closing thoughts? Did, did your mind change at all about how you can use apps and digital tools with young children? So if anybody wants to respond in the chat window um, to that, and I'm going to um, on advance onto the next slide, but I really want to know um, about what your thoughts are. My thoughts as I went through this journey of um, of how to look at apps for young children was that mobile technology and the apps that are a part of this can be used in meaningful ways even with the very youngest learners. Um, and that while screen time and media shouldn't dominate a young child's play, it can be used effectively to promote language um, and um, interactions with peers and the development of critical preschool skills. Um, so if any, I see a bunch of people are typing. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows in the handouts um, that um, Okay, um, I'm scrolling down. But in the handouts, that um, at, there's a link to a Digo um, list that has all of the links to all of the research, and then my Pinterest page has links to all of the apps that we showed. Um, and so a few people have posted. So um, Bridget says she loves Metamorphobet, and each touch gives a new response on the screen. Yeah, it's a great. Um, one because every touch means something. Um, I'm going to scroll up and see. Tammy said um, she scr struggles with the large smart board use in preschool classes. 
something like these apps and resources in small groups with more up close and reachable at the fingers of the child, absolutely. Um, with those, with the apps, uh, it, definitely having it in their hands um, and using it in centers can be um, can be really meaningful in that way. Um, Patricia talks about the book creator is great too. Yes. So um, some of these, there's a whole range of different book creator apps that are, book creator is a particular app, and there's a whole bunch of different ones where kids, young kids, can create books. Um, and that they can record instead of type, because we know that that spoken, um, that spoken um, comment on their illustrations is their first step into, um, is their first step into writing. Um, so we are at 4 o'clock. I, um, I'm all for, Patricia says, I'm all for tech, but just need more time to explore, have opportunities. Yep, absolutely. Um, kids need a balance of both, of exploring um, and suggesting app, effective apps. So thank you, Patricia, and I'm sorry um, that we didn't get to see it. Tammy asked, was, was that pufferfish? So it's called um, the puffer, the one with the pufferfish is, um, called Settle Your Glitter, and the little puffer guy right there. Um, and it's a great app that's out there. Another one is called Breathing Bubbles. They're both by the same um, company, and it's the same idea of using that app to help kids um, do some, uh, engage in some mindfulness, really. A few more comments. Um, apps and screen time is best when used with a partner. Um, and yes, you'll be able to access all of the slides and um, and be able to see the list of apps to explore. Again, they're all on my Pinterest page as well, which is in the handout. Um, so thank you guys. It's after four o'clock. Um, again, I'm really sorry that the screen sharing um, didn't seem to work because I would have loved to have shown you. But I hope that you guys now have a list of apps to go and explore and some good research that backs you up on why or why not to use apps with young kids and when and under what circumstances. Beth, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. Um, despite the technology issues that we were having, I think you gave us so much information to work with. Um, everybody needs to remember that the digital handout also has um, more information and access to the apps that um, that Beth was uh, sharing with us today. And I give you, Beth, um, an applause for how gracefully you went through uh, some of these technical issues because sometimes technology can fail us. What worked previously doesn't necessarily or always work um, when you need it. And I think it's pros like you that handle that uh, with such grace and, and patience. So thank you so much for sticking with us and all of you. Um, Please take a few moments to complete our brief survey. When you close out of today's webinar, you will automatically be taken to the survey page. If you have your pop-up blocked, you'll be able to get to the survey um, through the digital <coughs> handout. Um, and we certainly welcome your, uh, your feedback. So please take a few moments to, um, to do that for us. And I thank uh, Beth Poss again for this amazing webinar and um, thank my colleagues at CAST as well. You're welcome everyone and again now you'll just have to go and play with these yourself. Yes, yeah, thanks, Nicole, for your great captioning. Much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. I think we're ready to...